Good morning. Welcome to the Driller Newscast, a weekly update on the news and stories impacting the construction, drilling, water, and geothermal industry. I'm your host, Brock Yordy. We're going back to school, everybody. We're going to talk about some water rights bills that are being passed, the USDA Farm Bill. Of course, the Chevron deference is still coming up on our government agencies that are under attack. And our feature this week will be the Farm Bill and the Inflation Reduction Act and what does their future look like. But before we get into all this great news, let's go back to school on some safety. For this week in safety, we got a lot of future drillers, future pump setters, hydrogeologists, engineers, scientists, along with all the rest of the professionals in the world going back to school. That's right. We got a lot of little people from age five to all the way up to 18 starting school this week. And I think it's time we go back. We take some time to reflect on all of our heavy equipment movements and what it's been like. We've had a nice productive summer and it's still going, but we got a lot of distracted people on the roads and uh, as we operate these big trucks, drill rigs, pump hoists, we know they're not easy to stop. And it's dang hard to see everything that's going on from small vehicles to small people. According to safekids.org, last year, 40 children were hit by vehicles every day in the U.S. while walking, resulting in more than 15,000 injuries annually. We need to be aware of our school zones. We need to understand that school zones can extend one to two blocks beyond school property and may have constricted lanes and lots of distracted people walking nearby. This means drill crews, pump crews, geothermal drilling companies, industrial drillers, as we make our way through these areas, we need to plan a route. We need to plan ahead and anticipate how this new heavy traffic and potential hazards will be. We need to remember that we're in a hurry, trying to rush right into that long four-day weekend we have coming up with Labor Day. We need to think about maintaining our distance, keeping enough space between us and our truck and other vehicles so that we can react to those accidents, to those distracted people, to those new crosswalkers in training. Also, I can't instill this enough right now. Owners, supervisors, we need to think about those distractions and we need to stay focused with hand-free technology and understand where it's just appropriate to leave it down and wait until we get stopped. Again, on top of that, we need to be watching our speed and understanding those posted speeds and the reason why we do that, because that is the leading cause to these traffic fatalities and injuries and just all around mishaps. While driving in school zones and neighborhoods, we need to take extra care. Think about our parents and children doing the unexpected. Sudden stops double parked cars, children and parents entering the street without crosswalks, sometimes in crosswalks, clearly distracted as they're excited to get back to school. Parents are excited to get their full day back. And as I just read a statistic that there are over 50 million violations in school zones and around school buses a day during a school year, it's amazing to think about. We need to have that area 10 feet around a school bus as understanding the most dangerous. As we think of a job site in our danger areas, this is our danger areas because we have children that are excited to get back on the bus, get back off the bus. We need to stay far enough back and give them space to enter and exit the bus. 
it is illegal in all 50 states to pass school buses that have stopped to load and unload children. If the yellow or red lights are flashing and the stop arm is extended, traffic must stop. Never pass a bus from behind or either side of an undivided road when it is stopped to load or unload children. I want you to think about your little ones getting back to school. I want you to think about your grandchildren. I want to think about your friends, friends, and your community. It is very important uh, for us to think about these first few weeks and into the fall, how we're going to be treating our projects that we're commuting to, our big equipment. And remember, we're trying to recruit in this industry right now. So that service truck, that drill rig, that company placard pickup truck, it is an ambassador to our next generation. And that's not so good when we're causing accidents. Go out, be safe. This week in the news, let's jump back to the end of July, where the Subcommittee on Water, Wildlife, and Fisheries held the legislative hearing on 12 bills related to tribal water rights and settlements. These bills will secure water rights to the Tool River Tribe, the Blackfeet Tribe, Navajo Nation, the Hopi Tribe, San Juan Southern P2 Tribe, the Apache Tribe, and Crow Tribe. The House Committee on Natural Resources Chairman Bruce Westerman issued the following statement at the end of July's hearing. This is a statement. Today's hearing was an important chance for us to discuss Indian water rights settlements across the West and work towards peaceful negotiations rather than unnecessary litigation. I'd like to thank the numerous witnesses for their insight testimony today and my colleagues for their hard work on the legislation we discussed. If we look at this, we have seen Supreme Court discussions of the Navajo Nation versus the state of Arizona and the United States. We've seen the Hopi. We've seen so many tribal nations coming together because those water agreements we made supersede states. They are sovereign tribal nations. So to start with this discussion of unnecessary litigation, if we go to the end of June, we saw tribal nations taking up a case against 12 states for clean water quality and rights. We've just seen the state of Arizona release $5 billion for three tribes to use water out of the upper and lower Colorado basins, which very much comes from the Navajo Nation versus the United States and Arizona. So, Chairman Westerman of Arkansas, I think it's important that we remind the audience that earlier in G July, you and James Comer of Kentucky sent letters after the Chevron deference decision that stated the expansive administration state Chevron deference encourage has undermined it, our system of government, overburdening our citizenry, and threatening to overwhelm the founder's system of checks and balance. Thankfully, the courts in Loper Bright has now corrected its Chevron error, reaffirming that it is empathetically the province and the duty of the judicial departments to say what the law is. The long-needed reversal should stem vast tides of federal agencies' overreach, which was given by the Biden administration's track record. It drives me insane to think about this. And it starts with the implications of the Loper Bright and the limitations that is set of authority. <laughs> Loper Bright, as we learned from Jesse Richardson, 
was very much about oversight for overfishing. Obviously, it came from lower courts and the idea, and the same as the other 7,000 times the Chevron doctrine was utilized in court cases, or the 18,000 times it has been cited over the last 40 years was because oversight was necessary. So this is where we are. And as we talk about these water rights settlements versus litigation, the limitation of our executive branch agencies to be able to make decisions. Obviously, it comes back to Congress and law. And if it's unambiguous, that it has to have some interpretations, but the Supreme Court does not have all the bandwidth to hear all of these discussions. And I think it's very significant that we can't react fast enough to climate impacts. This is the reason we keep coming back to the Chevron deference, is the ability for federal agencies to enforce regulation, especially once that idea of impact of air quality, water quality, and protecting mother nature. This is very important, not to mention protecting people from all of those other agencies, from the FDA to OSHA to banks and securities. So, of course, we've hit this point of Congress wanting to speed through agreements or acts. Because with a Chevron deference, the door is now open for legal challenges to any regulation that is not soundly defined. And sadly, Congress is not full of scientists, engineers, geologists, hydrogeologists, climate scientists, or even environmental legal scholars. There can be a few. We elect people that are good at getting things done and relying on experts in the room to be the voice of reason. But let's consider all those in power to create narratives with wrong motives, with the wrong reasons. How do we defend rules that protect the environment when those with the most money can create those amicus briefs to argue the fact versus fiction? Like I said, 7,000 cases utilized the Chevron Doctrine We're eliminating the ability of these government agencies to do what they need to do by creating this narrative of an overreaching agency facade. I want you to think of it this way. The water we drink, the air we breathe, that airplane we fly into conferences and to job sites, the trains traveling through those communities, what's inside them? The rules established for highway protection and safety. The rules for banks and retirement accounts. Job safety rules to keep our people safe. And the quality of the medical professional that you and your family engage with or the care you receive, these are all up for discussion. So it's fantastic that the House Committee of Natural Resources found time to create so many new water rights settlement acts of 2024, 12 in total. However, as we see, most of our water rights and compacts are over a hundred years old. <laughs> Even as we look back 18 to 20 years ago, we didn't see the water rights shortage. I just saw a TikTok of Idaho farmers saying, we have the most water we've ever had. Let us use it or we'll just take it. If that happens in the Ogallala, what happens? 
I want you to think about extreme weather and drought and the significant events impacting groundwater and waters of the United States and reservoirs. Again, the Navajo Nation one year ago lost to Arizona and the United States over discussions on the amount of water they were allotted. In last week's newscast, episode 121, we sat down with Jesse Richardson and talked about Texas versus New Mexico. And that was only 66,000 acre feet that was allotted to Texas. So sovereign nations, tribes, you got what you deserved. Is it a reaction to what could be? I absolutely believe so. So good job, House Committee. Now, how about that farm bill? It's been since 2018. So that we're playing fair, March 11th, 2024, Biden administration signed into another $460 billion appropriation, which will continue to fund the farm bill until the 30th of December. The clock is ticking. The USDA and five other federal departments depend on this bill for funding. And we've had four failed attempts this year. In early June, the House Appropriations Committee released a proposed funding bill for 2025 in their Agriculture Appropriations Bill, which determined how much funding the USDA should get and it was cut by 3.6% from 2024. Point of entry protection to private wells for PFAS or other contaminants for rural water, for rural electric electricity co-ops. There is plenty in the farm bill. And that leads exactly into what I want to talk about in our feature this week, which is the next 10 years of the Farm Bill and the Inflation Reduction Act, and what does that future look like? For this week's feature, let's go back to school. We need to start talking about the importance of the USDA Farm Bill, its future, and the Inflation Reduction Act future. They both have big implications for the drilling industry. The Farm Bill is bipartisan. It has funding for farmers, farm loans, conservation programs, that fund farmers and ranchers to improve water programs, reduce soil erosion, and disaster assistance, which allows rehabilitation of farmland and ranch land after natural disasters, which currently fall with failing infrastructure and dams after excessive rains. As we look at what's important in our country, this farm bill is estimated at $1.5 trillion over 10 years. If we go back to school and learn something here, that's only 2% of our federal spending. Beyond just our industry drilling irrigation wells, the Farm Bill has water source protection programs. Think about that. Phosphates and nitrates in our water. The Driller Newscast episode 118 talked about the impact of ephemeral streams on drinking water quality to reservoirs and eventually groundwater. This directly goes back into source protection programs. The Farm Bill has emergency community water assistant grant programs, which was proposed to go up from 35 million to 50 million in 2019. That was only until 2023. We've talked about this point many times on the newscast. The USDA Farm Bill has grant funding for point of entry protection, not only for rural areas for lead removal, but also for point of entry for areas that are affected by PFAS contamination. The Farm Bill is directly connected to groundwater and water well drilling as a whole. And from its extension to its deadline, 
which is now September 30th, 2024. We've been in this limbo, this stall. And a big push for the farm bill is it's split between the elimination of SNAP funding. Let's go back to school again. The history of the Farm Bill has been to cover agriculture and nutrition policy. That's what the United States Department of Agriculture is about. In the 70s, the food stamp program, which is now called SNAP, was incorporated to help create bipartisanism in rural and urban communities for the funding of the Farm Bill. We have urban farms, we have rural farms with point of entry protection for urban impacted areas and we have point of entry protection for those 14 million private water wells that are out there if they need it. Today, to push the unity further, the Farm Bill considers greenhouse gas emissions and the reduction and has built-in incentives to create more unity. However, the big debate has come from the Inflation Reduction Act which issued nearly $11 billion for electrification infrastructure in rural America for the USDA to distribute. Again, as we put the executive branch agencies, these overreaching agencies, under a magnifying glass and decide that we should just smash the heck out of them with a sledgehammer, they're the ones qualifying and helping distribute these funds. So here we are, the second week of August, steam rolling fast through September 30th through October, right into November 5th, with the largest farm bill to date yet to be agreed on. As we're having our discussions, the National Groundwater Association Smart Groundwater Policies Fly-In has had a piece for advocation for the farm bill every time they go to Capitol Hill. It's because the Farm Bill is for protecting groundwater and for good groundwater policies. And it is very important to us. Now, onto the Inflation Reduction Act and its future. Because let's face it, here we are talking about it again. And in episode 114 of the Driller Newscast, we discussed the Inflation Reduction Act post-election. And I said, Congress is going to be razor thin, and we need to consider that there are plenty of policies there for the IRA that are positive, from biofuels for farmers in Iowa and the Midcon to rural electrification. There's so many pieces that we need for our infrastructure. But as we've watched the week's turn, there are definitely pieces that are now up for being cut that directly impact the drilling industry. So let's go back to school on the IRA. The goal of the IRA is to reduce U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by a minimum of 33% by 2030. And that is from the 2005 levels. If we hit that, that is a $5 trillion global economic benefit by 2050, the IRA had goals of lowering electricity rates by 9% and gas prices by 13% by 2030, which will save Americans tens of billions of dollars. The IRA has tax benefits of 30% for upgrading homes and buildings. That comes back to installing ground source geothermal looking at all the great technologies that are going to help us with that electrical grid issue we have. This Friday is August 16th. It marks two years since the Inflation Reduction Act was signed. Ironically, 
February 2nd, 2023, was the first time Congress put up a bill titled Repeal the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. This was H.R. 812. In the morning, the same time as Punxsutawney Phil determined if we had six more weeks of winter, the House is determining if we got 600 more years of life on this planet. I want you to think about the importance of the IRA. Since then, there has been 41 additional times the repeal of the IRA has been taken up. That's right, 23 votes on the House floor, 19 votes in committees and subcommittees. Drillers, even at one point in February of 2023, the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Environment Manufacturing Critical Minerals had an 11 to 6 fold with a discussion to eliminate this bill. That's right. I want you to think back a year and a half ago as we talked about these pieces. We had strategic plans for independence from foreign mined materials. We enabled the Defense Production Act to streamline rare earth mineral exploration and production. The Inflation Reduction Act, along with the Farm Bill and the federal infrastructure law, have influenced our ability to grow our businesses and provide family self-sustaining wages. This isn't about who's sitting in the Oval Office. This is about our representation in Congress, who is empowered right now to make the laws that protect air quality, water quality, and ensure that we continue down this path of becoming net zero. So again, it is important in November that we support individuals in the House and Senate that are smart and capable of being environmental stewards and drilling industry advocates for the right type of drilling. It's going to be razor thin. We don't know who will have majority. But what we do know is we can empower both sides of the aisle. The next discussion you have in the coffee shop or bigger on a state level with one of your representatives or on a federal level with one of your local representatives, ask that steward, what are you going to do with the farm bill and how do you support the Inflation Reduction Act? This isn't about taking cheeseburgers and barbecue grills and big diesel trucks off the road. This is about air quality, water quality, and empowering our executive branch agencies who are empowered by the commander in chief and the cabinet. How they are able to work from overfishing to ensuring that that individual that comes in to check your heart is qualified to make sure that it's safe. We have a lot to think about here. We cannot afford to go backwards with the Inflation Reduction Act, and we cannot afford to see larger cuts to the Farm Bill. These are things we need to be thinking about, and that's why I'm saying as our young people are going back to school, we need to be getting back to school, understanding who represents us appropriately and what we want to see Congress get done. Because of course, laws to protect groundwater, to protect states' rights to groundwater, to protect sovereign tribal nations' rights to their water and their water quality, is the way it should be. And that's going to take the right individuals on both sides of the aisle to do it. Make sure your vote's heard. There is so much great news coming out right now. 
Jump on the driller.com. JJ Smith is in DC in meetings on PFAS, on water reuse, on geothermal, on the Inflation Reduction Act, on what's happening with the EPA, what's happening with the OSHA. Our driller writing staff is kicking butt, grabbing every story that's coming out. We want to hear from you. We have more future drillers to come. We have more emerging drillers. We have lots of great content. Check out the driller.com. Go to our social media pages, like, and subscribe. And like always, you're empowered to have your voice heard through an article, an interview to, hey, I called up my representative and I had a discussion we did a letter writing campaign. The Groundwater Association came together and we helped incite change for our drilling industry. We're less than one and a half percent of the entire United States working population. But there's nothing more important than making water come out of the ground, protecting Mother Nature. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>